Good afternoon and welcome to today's EHS Today webcast, Human-Robot Collaboration, Robot Safety Requirements, sponsored by PILS. My name is Stephanie Valentic, Associate Editor of EHS Today. Before we begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First, if at any time you are having audio difficulties or slides are not advancing, simply hit your F5 key to refresh your webcast council. If you have any technical difficulties during today's session, please press the Help button on your player council to receive assistance in solving common issues. This webinar technology allows you to resize the presentation by clicking the Maximize icon or by dragging the lower right corner to enlarge the window. We welcome your questions during today's event. In order to submit your questions to today's presenter, simply type your question into the question window on the left side of your screen and hit Submit. We'll be answering as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation, but please feel free to send your questions in at any time and we'll add them to the queue. Please also be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the EHS Today website within the next week for you to review. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. On your council, the PILS logo is hotlinked. If you want to visit their website during this webcast, you can click on the logo and a new window will open. This will not take you out of the event. And now I would like to welcome our presenter. Dan Rosso has a degree in electrical technology from Henry Ford Community College and has been certified as a certified machinery safety expert. Dan has nearly 10 years of machinery support and services in industrial automation applications. He has been with PILS Automation Safety for over three years as a safety engineer and technical trainer. Dan, the floor is yours. Thanks, Stephanie. Hi, my name is Dan Rosso, and I am a technical trainer here with PILS. Um, and today we're going to be talking about HRC methods and applications. There are different types of HRC methods that we're going to discuss today. We're going to look through the benefits of HRC robotics steps of the HRC robotic risk assessment, some unique hazards, different body regions and force contacts and pressures that need to be applied to HRC applications, risk reduction measures by force limiting, and we're going to talk about the validation requirements for an HRC application. What is collaborative operation? Well, collaborative operation has been around just as long as any type of robotics has been around. What is the type of collaboration that we need to worry about? Whether it's permitting humans to access a robot while power to the servos is on, robot in automatic operation, a robot is executing its program. The robot may be permitted to have an auto restart, or it may even be permitted to keep moving while you're doing your task. Here you can see in this slide, we have shared workspace along with coexisting and shared workspaces and separate workspaces. Here the, the shared workspace, the operator and the robot are, are within the same vicinity and working together to do a task. There is possible contact between the operator and the robot. On the same side, we have an infrequent and unintended interaction with the robot. Or based off the frequency of exposure, the tasks associated are not going to be as frequent. We have the coexisting operator who is working in between the two different robot cells. What are the different types of human and robot interaction? We have the coexistence, which is the human and robot do not work in the same workspace. There's so sequential cooperation. Human and robots share a workspace, but no simultaneous motion within the workspace and no, no intended contact between the human and the robot. The parallel cooperation, human and robot share a workspace with simultaneous but separate motion within the workspace and no intended contact between the human and the robot will happen. Then we have collaboration. Human and robot share workspace will simultaneously overlapping motion within the workspace. Here, intended contact between the human and the robot is anticipated. Within 
robotic standards, we have a new technical specification, ISO TS15066. That defines four specific types of methods for HRC collaboration. Method one, which is a safety rated monitor stop. Method two, hand guiding. Method three, speed and separation monitoring. And number four, power and force limiting. Method one, safety rated monitor stop. It's defined as, as a, an operator that is going to be working with a robot within a defined space. So in this example here, you see an operator has to walk into a load-unload station to load a part for the robot. The robot could be either waiting in the zone or outside the zone. If it's in the load-unload area, it's not allowed to move until the operator has exited the zone. If it's doing a task in the non-load-unload station, it's not permitted to move into there until the operator is out. You have hand guiding. Hand guiding allows the, the robot to move to a specific location and the operator is able to use controls either on the end effector or separate control to hand guide the end of arm tooling to a specific location to pick up, pick up a part or drop one off. This is done through safety rated speed. And we have speed and uh, separation monitoring. Speed and separation monitoring are done through things like safe vision systems, laser scanners, even light curtains. Based off the distance from the hazard, the robot may either slow down to a safe rated speed or may even stop as you approach the robot. This allows to eliminate the hazards while you're in the area doing a task. And then once you leave the task, either this robot will speed back up or you are to reset the safety system and start the machine process back up. So methods one, two, and three have always been around. It's method four, which is our power and force limiting, which is, is what is new. Here, it is limited based off the power and the force of the robot. These are also uh, described in ISO TS15066. So based off the design of the robot itself, the power and force is limited through torque and force on the servo motors. So by the inherently safe design and the software that's programmed into these robots, it allows them to be safe based off the amount of force and pressure they can exert onto a human or an object. We also have combinations of these methods. So we could have a speed and separation monitoring, along with power and force limiting, combined together into one cell. In this case, the robot will slow down from a high speed to a reduced safe speed when someone approaches. The robot continues to operate in the reduced force limited mode until the operator starts leaves the area, and then the robot returns to the high force, high speed area when the operator leaves. This allows production to keep moving, but also allowing safe access for the operator to access the work cell. So here we have a described area. You can see here they're using laser scanners to monitor the areas where the human could come in or come in contact with the robot where the work pieces or work machines are not currently in place. Our, our different types of methods are defined in ENISO 10218-2. On the safety rate monitor stop, the speed and separation monitoring and hand guiding are all done with traditional industrial and service robots. The power and force limiting applications are done by a new specific type of robot. And that's what we refer to as our human collaborative or cobot. Power and force limiting. Here we have ABB. They are inherently safe operation by force and power limiting. 
here they have a unique two-arm setup. Here we have the KUKA LBR, the IWA. It's controlled by uh, force. They have seven and uh, 14 kilogram models. And here, based off what axis of the robot is moving, determines how many, the amount of force can be applied. You have the universal UR3, 5, and 10, which is all controlled by force through the servo motors. And then the FANUC robots, which is force limited by control. Here they have a 4 and 7 model. They even have a 35 kg model that are all done through force monitoring. There are several other manufacturers out there that also have collaborative robots that meet the requirements of 15066. One thing, one advantage to the collaborative robots is it, it can possibly eliminate the use of safety fences, interlock doors, safety tunnels, light curtains, and other types of traditional safeguarding. But this is all based off the application. Every single application needs to be verified and designed appropriately. One advantage is uh, being able to get rid of the traditional safeguarding helps save floor space. So you don't have all this extra guarding taking up the uh, floor space on the plant floor. Now you're able to put operators or other machinery closer together. Yeah. Smaller HRC robots could also possibly work within the same space as a, as a normal operator or maintenance technician. So here, in this example, instead of having four operators, they have two operators and two robots working collaboratively together on this conveyor line. You can also automate part of the cell. Instead of having four operators on the demanding task, we could have three robots with one operator, with the operator monitoring the robots for proper operation. Some of the standards for robotics. In the United States, we have ANSI RA 15.06, shortened in 2012, which is Robotics and Robotic Devices, Safety Requirements for Industrial Robot, Part 1 and Part 2. Here, that also correlates to 1028 EN ISO 10218-1 and 10218-2. Along with in Canada, we see Z44, Ted 434, 2014. There's some technical specifications that deal with specifically with collaborative industrial robots, which is ISO TS15066. It was published in February 2016. And since then, we have actually adopted an ANSI TR, R15.606, which is the collaborative industrial robot standard within the United States. Here we have an example of a collaborative work, work cell. Here the robot picks up the part, loads the pallet, sets the orientation and locates the part, and sets the part feature into the proper location on the tray. So here we have the restricted space and the maximum reach space and the normal operating space. Our three normal spaces we work within any type of robotic cell. But we need to have proper safeguards in place in order to make sure this cell is safe to work with, work with them. So in order to do our risk assessment, we need to identify the types of tasks that might be associated with this cell. Well, here we have a normal operation where the ro ro robot works autonomously. The operator works adjacent to, but may periodically work ahead of the robot workstation. With periodic quality inspections of the robot station. With some minor servicing or maintenance activities, which is the operator unjams the part pickup operation. They do this typically once per shift. Operator unjams part load operation, typically two times per hour. Operator correct part setting if the robot cannot, typically twice per shift. We have a setup, task, which are the pallet changeover to a new part once per shift, and we have cleaning. 
which start, is at the start of each shift for about two minutes. We need to go through and identify our major hazards. We have the robotic motion, we have the gripper hazard, where it's either being gripped in between the part and the gripper or just the gripper on your on a finger. Um, then we also have some of the conveyor and pallet hazard, hazards, such as the motion of the pallet moving down or knit points on the rollers on the conveyor. The operator is exposed and may interact with the moving robot with contact that's both intentional and unintentional. Just like any other normal risk assessment, we need to worry about foreseeable hazards and foreseeable misuse. So with specifically with the collaborative robots, we have to worry about different types of hazards now. We have some new risk sources, such as impact hazards. Here we might be impacted by the robot wrist, or we might be impacted by second or third access, impacted by the gripper, or by the part. We also have to worry about crush hazards. Are there crush ha hazards between the gripper and the fixture, the gripper and the part, maybe being crushed on the arm, or even being crushed between the arm and the non-supporting structure. You also have to worry about the gripper itself, your finger being crushed between the gripper and the part, or just within the, no, the fingers of the gripper. Finger, uh, you have entrapment in the gripper or the part opening, depending on the design of the gripper. It often be entrapped within the different axes of the robot. So the access body region exposure and risk. The robot program must be designed to avoid the head and neck region. So the orientation and the mounting of the, of the robot is key within a collaborative application. You do not want the robot to be able to access the head and neck region for contact points. We have to assess each risk. So here we're going to look at unjamming the, uh, an unjam task at the pallet load. Here the robot gripper with part crushes the operator's hand. So if we do a simple risk assessment, we can see the degree of possible harm. If broken bones, if the force limit fails, only pain if the force is working correctly. So we're going to have a minor broken bone. Frequency of exposure is hourly. The task is performed every two hours. We have a possibility of avoidance, but it's possible under certain conditions to avoid it, depending on the speed and path. So it is possible under certain conditions. And the probability of the hazardous event occurring is almost impossible because we're going to limit the force with the limit safety function. It's equivalent to performance level D. So our probability of hazardous event is 0 0.05, almost impossible. So here we can multiply these four factors together, and we have a negligible risk based off the force control is being reliable, and the contact stays below the pain thresholds. So based off the circuit performance, the safety function, if the force limit is exceeded, then it needs to initiate a protective stop. Now how, how reliable does this have to be? The software must be re, re, uh, rated as a performance level equal to D. The big thing about collaborative robots is we have to worry about pain and injury thresholds. We have to be able to control and limit the exposure to these values. So we have a minimum injury threshold. Exceeding this limit will result in a minor laceration, not requiring stitches, or contusion, basically a bruise. These limits are not defined. But what we do worry about in collaborative operations is the pain threshold. Exceeding this limit will result in a, a sensation of pain. These are the limits developed by in a university study. This study was basically done until a person said, ow. A large variety of people were studied, all of different ages, 
male and female, along with people that do different um, employment tasks. Somebody that works in an office for somebody that may work in a factory. So what they did is that they studied two separate different types of contacts, quasi-static and transient. Within here, we have the biomechanical limits that were established based off the study. We have quasi-static force and pressure limits, transient force and pressure limits, and energy flux limits. So what is a quasi-static event? Quasi-static event is an event that lasts greater than half a second, where the force remains consistent, constant. The contact is constrained. So you're being crushed, or held, or trapped. Here we have a transient contact, where it is basically just the robot bumping into you. You're bumping into part of it. The impulse peak cannot extend greater than half a second. So what they've done is they've gone through and it's established different body regions, nearly 15 or 16 different body regions, and 29 specific body areas within those regions. They came up with uh, quasi-static and transient values. So here you can see the body model of the different regions, and then here you can see the biomechanical limits for the specific body areas. With the maximum permissional pressure for quasi-static and force, and the same thing for transit. We have Here we have multipliers for pressure and force. And here's the rest of the table, so the remaining 29 specific body areas. And based off the body region exposure for this task, so here we have a robot gripper picking up and placing little cells into a tray. What is exposed to your fingers, hands, and the lower arm. So here we have a, a hazard of crush between the part and the fixture. So we've got to be able to contact, be able to worry about our pressure calculations. So what we need to do is calculate out the surface area. So in this case, yes, the width of the brick is 10 millimeters, but the surface area contact is only going to be 7 millimeters on your finger. So here we're going to take the width, which is 1 centimeter times 0.7 centimeters, you get 0.7 centimeters squared, and calculate out our contact pressure through a theoretical force of 150 newtons of over 0.7 centimeters squared. We get 214 newtons per centimeter squared. What we have to do is be able to transpose that into our tables. So here we have the static force measured, which is 150 newtons. There's the contact pressure and our contact surface area. What we have to be able to do is get our estimated pain onset all at or under the accepted values. Here you see the listed values of 150, 160, 135. The different colors indicate whether the limits had been met or at the limit or are under. In this case, we have several limits that are well over our accepted values. So what we need to be able to do is limit our static force for the application and make sure our estimated pain onset is at or below the acceptable values of pain onset. Here, what they did is they lowered static force. Whether they increased the surface area in this case, they did the same, so they slowed down the robot to create less force. Other risk reduction measures that you may be able to take into is the use of padding. The padding can absorb some of the impact, use compliant mechanical members such as springs, use resilient linkages that are flexible or collapsible. Some other guidelines to consider when looking at the application. You shouldn't have any sharp or pointed edges, no shear or cutting edges. 
I would have a minimum contact surface of 30 millimeters squared. Minimum contact surface width should be a good, should be at least five millimeters. Look at a look at a feature radius of at least 2.5 millimeters. Minimum feature included at least 30 millimeter, 30 degrees. And design for contact pressures not exceeding 50 newtons per centimeter squared. Line holes deeper than five millimeters and through holes shall not be greater than six millimeters in diameter. There's also things like tactile coverings that can go on the outside of the robot. It can sense contact and stop the robot. Another thing we also need to worry about is our transient contacts. These are going to be impacts from the robot. Here, the transient event forces are difficult to measure. Instead, limit the speed to keep the energy flux within the biomechanical limits. This all depends on the effective robot mass, such as the size of the robot and the robot components. So based off the different body region, we have different mass, uh, maximum transferred energy that are allowed based off the elasticity in the skin. Here we need to identify the different moving parts of the robot. Once you identify the different moving parts of the robot for the application, we can go through and calculate out our momentum transfer and our energy flux. So here the energy is transferred based off the effective mass of the robot. In our example here, we're going to use a UR10 that has a total mass of 28.9 kgs. The arm has a moving mass of 23.1. This is dictated out from the manufacturer's information. So we're going to have a total payload, which includes the end of arm tooling and the part, which weighs five kilograms. So if we look to the equation MR, being our energy flux over the mass of the robot, or the moving mass of the robot over two plus the ML, which is the total payload we get 16.6 kgs. So here we can come to the table, I'm sorry, this graph, and find out what region of the body is going to be impacted. You can see here there are several different lines based off the impact zones of the body. In our case, we're going to look at the chest, which is going to be the very bottom blue line with the diamonds. So what we do is we find out where the effective robot mass is on the bottom axis, we find roughly here 16 kilograms. We find out where it crosses the chest line and come over to our Y axis and find out the speed limit for this application. So in this case, it's 450 millimeters per second. Some other Awareness requirements that go into HRC applications is that there is a requirement for safety glasses to be worn within the within any HRC application. We also have to make sure we denote the restricted space or a collaborative area. So here, this could be outlined by hanging signs from the ceiling, coloring the floor a different color what that area needs to be denoted as a collaborative work area to make people well aware. And then along with things such as traditional warning signs also need to be implemented. How do we validate the system before use? We need to go through and measure the actual forces. We need to analyze resulting contact pressures, set the exposed Expose all body regions to ensure operation below the paint threshold and confirm speed limits are met. What we can do is we have a collision measurement device such as the PILS Probe MS. Here it works as two different objects. Here we can do force measurement based off the of force gauge. It also includes a spring set and evaluation software to install on a PC. We can also measure pressure using pressure-sensitive pressure film, some different pads to 
to emulate the different elasticity in the skin. Also comes with a scanner and evaluation software. So here you can see an example of the UR robot here impacting the probe. And within, you can see the graph there, our first up to 500 milliseconds, which is our half a second. Our transient contact is less than half a second. And our quasi-static is consistent beyond that half a second. We are below the designated red line, which is designated by the different body region. With that line will vary depending on the impact zone of the body. We just don't repeat this test once. We do it numerous times to make sure we have consistent results. We also do pressure measurements. So we put a, a film onto the top of the pressure measurement to contact to get the contact pressure. We scan the film into some evaluation software and we are able to read the contact pressures. So here at Pills, as robotic services, we are able to go through and do the, the HRC risk assessments from the, you know, from the theoretical phase and the application through risk assessment, integration, and validation. I'll kick it back over to you, Stephanie. Okay, uh, thank you, Dan. It was an excellent presentation. A few of you have already submitted questions, so we're going to jump right in. While our presenters are answering your questions, please take a moment to complete the feedback form that appears on the left side of your screen. All right, question number one. Um, how do you isolate energy sources on a robot to perform servicing without dropping the robot? You're going to have to have some kind of external source, such as a prefabricated stand that you might move the robot into to hold it up. You know, you might have to have some kind of external rigging, a possible overhead crane of some sort, but um, you're going to have to ha have some kind of pre-designed uh, stand to possibly hold it. Typically, the best way to do it. Otherwise, if you remove a gearbox out of one of the out of one of the accesses, the whole robot will fall. So you do have to uh, try and support it as you service the robot, and then energy then isolate the energy appropriately, whether it's electrical, hydraulic, pneumatic, the full energy isolation at that point. Okay, um, what if a person bends down and it hits them in the head instead of the chest? How is that handled? Um, that's, one of the, that's one of the tasks that you're going to have to uh, think about during the application, is if somebody were to bend down, which is a foreseeable type of contact, so during the analysis, you are going to have to think about what type of body positions could the operator be standing in. So if they drop apart and it were to possibly hit them in the head, that's something that needs to be in your risk assessment and analyzed. Okay. Uh, how do you measure the... Sorry, go ahead. It all depends on the mounting of the robot. So. so how do you measure the contact force or impact in a reliable way? So we have that uh, PILS program, uh, program S which will actually calculate everything out based off of you. We, we literally take that out into the application in the field, and we go through the different motions of the robot based off its program, and the robot at the contacts the probe to measure the force and pressure. We hook that up to our, uh, our laptops that have software on it, so we're able to analyze the, the forces and pressures. How do you determine the total force exerted by the robot? Um, kind of ties into the, with the, the previous answer, but each different robot is going to have different limits, whether it's speed and force. Um, so what you're going to actually have to do, depending on the manufacturer, is go through and your application and measure the forces physically, and then adjust the proper parameters within the robot controller based off the task or um, the 
robot manufacturer specifications for limiting the force within the different uh, movements of the robot motion. Uh, so what is the amount of force required to break a bone? I'm sure the force would differ based on the bone. Is there a table that has these values? Um, the values that are within ISO 15066 or ANSI R15.606 are all based off pain threshold. So the allowable forces that, are, that meet the standards requirements are basically until somebody says, ow, is how the table is dictated. Um, so there's, they, there are tables available out there on bone breakage, but based off the requirements for this, um, it's all based off the limits of saying how. So how do you measure the static force? The different forces um, are measured with the program, uh, with, with our probe that we have. Um, we situate the probe in the robot motion and measure the force based off the different areas. You know, we do have other external gauges we do use too. So some of them are analog, some of them are digital. Um, so just based off the application and things like that, um, we're able to go through and verify the forces. Um, would laser curtains help prevent some impact instances? Yeah, things like laser scanners or light curtains um, can actually help prevent the impacts. Um, but the design of the collaborative robots is to work without traditional safeguarding. But that's not necessarily always a true fact, though. You know, you may have to have traditional safeguarding in order to prevent contact with the robot, depending on the speeds and the forces it can exert. You can't meet the force limits based off within the standard. You aren't able to um, you're going to have to use traditional safeguarding for your risk reduction methods. Um, can you discuss lockout tagout procedures needed when entering a robotic cell? Well, based off lockout tagout, lockout tagout is full energy isolation. So based off tasks, um, if you're doing a full, you know, doing some kind of a, a detailed maintenance task within the cell, you're going to need full energy isolation, pneumatic, hydraulic, gravity, electrical, whatever type of hazards that are exposed to, you have to have some kind of isolation, whether you're blocking things in place, pinning them in place. Um, and then you also have what's, you know, here um, in the United States, the minor servicing activities. So based off a task that is deemed routine, repetitive, and integral to production, um, you may be able to not do full energy isolation per lockout tagout, but you're going to have to have some kind of alternative methods to protect the operator, such as a, a control system or other types of safeguarding. So. Are there smart robots that can detect material variants, such as the difference between metal and flesh? Within robots, no. The robot is going to like impact whatever it comes into impact with. Now there are sensors out there you put on the robot end to sense for part pickup, but there are no real distinguishes between what human and machine or metal surfaces. It's just hitting an object. Can a robot detect size and shape? Um, just trying to realize some fail-safe possibilities. Based off size and shape, um, in a collaborative operation or even industrial, um, no, they cannot without the aid of external devices such as like vision systems or cameras or you know measuring devices. Um, that's the only way that it's going to be able to determine what's going on. That's mostly for part pickup for you know inspection or part placement and things like that, but not you know being impacted by a robot. So when should you not use a collaborative robot? 
Collaborative robots are nice for activities that, you know, are not super high speed. Um, you can even use them in high speed applications. You just kind of have to use traditional safeguards possibly to maintain safe forces. Um, based off, of safe, you know, if you're going to be able to not Im implement a collaborative robot without traditional safeguards, that's probably your best bet. But it's all as an as is case by case basis. Um, and how you mount the robot, and who's going to be interacting with it. So there's a lot of ifs that go into any different type of robotic installation. So I can't really think of any, you know, certain specific reasons, but it's just kind of an as-is, case-by-case basis. So how is the maximum space for the operator designated? How do they know if they are too close? Well, based off the robot standards, uh, ISO 10218-1 and dash 2 or our RIA 15.06, um, the maximum space for robot always has to be safeguarded um, unless there's external things such as hard stops, safety rated software that limits the motion of the robot. Otherwise, you're always supposed to take, in, take into account the maximum reach of the robot with the end effector and its part in place. Um, what is the response time between speed and force limiters? Can the human operator move too quickly into the space before the speed limiter engages? Uh, basically, what's going to happen with a collaborative robot is it's not going to turn off until it impacts you. Um, if you're talking a standard, uh, standard industrial robot that's not a collaborative robot by force or torque limiting, it's all going to be dependent on the size of the robot, the speed, the payload, uh, there's a lot of different factors that go into it. Uh, most of the robot manufacturers can give you average stop time based off the robot, but then if you have an external control system, safety control system that feeds the input to the robot, that can all add more latency to the stop time. So every application is going to be different. Can you please share an example of risk assessment of the risk assessment process for a robotic cell apart from the typical flow chart? Um, there's the hazard rating number system that's out there. That's a numerical system that you multiply um, frequency of exposure, number of people exposed, the degree of possible harm, and the probability of occurrence. Um, there's multiple matrices out there that are available. Um, there's IS, if you want to look for specific examples, you can look to ISO 14121, um, ISO TR 14121 um, for some ex examples and guidance. There's an ANSI standard that also gives some examples of different risk assessments. There's software available. There's plenty of different sources out there for different types of methods. Um, we can also help you with that too. Okay, um, what if the robot is handling some hand tools? Would it need safeguards around the tools or around the entire machine? Uh, every, there's thousands of different types of end effectors and end of arc tooling out there, so each one is going to have to be analyzed individually. But in the HRC application, if there's sharp edges or protrusions that somebody could get cut on, um, you're going to have to have some kind of risk reduction method to make sure that doesn't impact the, bot, the human body and cause um, beyond the proper force limits. If it goes beyond those force limits and can start having uh, a, a greater hazard, the um, risk reduction is going to have to be typical safeguarding. Is the OSHA lockout tagout standard applicable to robotics or the ISO ANSI standards? Any machine that operates within the continental United States or its foreign nations is, uh, has to meet the lockout tagout requirements. Um, Europe 
or interna internationally, they don't have lockout tagout like we do here prescribed, but we all do protect against unexpected startup, which is all, which should all be di dictated out in a task-based risk assessment. But for every task, there should be some kind of associated hazard. And based off that, the different modes of operation, tasks associated with those modes of operation should be analyzed the different hazards and what type of energy isolation or control reliable safeguarded area um, solution can be used for that task. Ideally, ideally would we want a robot to contact a worker and if so, why? No, you do not want a robot to contact a worker, but the collaborative robots allow for that interaction in case it were to happen for unintended impact. So it also cuts down on costs because you don't have other things such as, you know, safety control systems are not as complex, standard safeguarding gives you a lot more greater flexibility within the um, areas of your production facilities. So you, you don't, you're not taking up as much room on the plant floor with traditional safeguards with, with a collaborative robot. Um, if three employees walk into a robotic cell to work or clean, um, for instance, to pick up a part, do all three need to place a lockout, a lock under lockout tagout? Yes, they do. Each individual so operator if, must. Sorry, go ahead. No, each, yeah, each individual operator must place a lock on there. Because each one has needs to be, have full energy isolation. What type of average body mass is being used for these calculations? There's a wide variety of different body masses and the different types of people, different wide wide variety of ages, males, females, and teenagers all the way up to uh, senior citizens. So these are a large, very a large audience was used for um, the study. Do the standards provide guidance to hard guarding light curtain trade-offs? Standards don't necessarily tell you how to safeguard a machine. Um, they give you the available techniques on how to safeguard a machine. You can look to C-type standards like the robotic standard, give you examples on how to safeguard a machine, but every application is different. Um, and there's, different, there's a wide variety of technologies that can be used with any given type of machine or installation. So typically up to the integrator or the OEM that's installing the machine to uh, dictate the safeguards. Does the robot software allow the operators to speed up the robot after the initial assessment? Only engineering and programming people should be able to dictate the speed of the robot. Um, you know, if there's speed variations within the program, normal operation, that's, that's based off the individual cell and the task at hand. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a robot cell that you can just walk up and the operator can just speed the process right up. I don't think I've ever seen that. What is the reliability of the force limiting feature? Are there verifications required? And if so, at what frequency? The uh, software built into the collaborative robots is equivalent to a performance level D for ISO 13849-1. So they are, it, is a very it is a very reliable type of software. Um, there needs to be an initial assessment and verify the forces. And then based off from there, um, you don't necessarily have to go through and verify the forces on a regular basis, but just like any given safety PLC, the robot controllers have checksum numbers. And each individual configuration has an, a, a specific checksum number per that installation and program. Um, so it'd be very hard to find two checksums that are, that are, that are identical. So as long as that checksum number has not changed, 
nobody's tampered with or has changed any of the program that's in the robot or the control system. So that would, that's as easy as your um, check would have to be. It's just verifying that that checksum has not been modified in the safety system. Um, if I buy the same cobot model, do I need to measure force and pressure for each one, even if they are used in duplicate applications? Um, I would probably, you know, do the first two, and then if you have multiple applications, as long as you can guarantee everything is identical, um, you could probably get away with that. Um, but I would still go through and do periodic checks just to make sure each cell is maintaining its proper safeguard. Does robotic guardian standard supersede ANSI B155.1 and ANSI B11.19? ANSI B1119 is a B-type standard. Uh, the robotic standards are C-type standards. So if a C-type standard, like the robot standard, um, goes against or contradicts a B-level standard, such as the 1119, the C-level wins. So the robotic standard would take precedence over the B-level, such as B1119. What about the type of saw that drops the blade when it comes into contact with a finger or a limb? What type of sensing is that? Sensing body flesh. Um, if you have some kind of saw blade, I would definitely say that it could not come in contact with the human um, skin. Uh, you know, if you had a sharp point, it would have to meet the requirements of the force limits um, in the standard. If you go beyond that, traditional safeguarding would probably have to be used. Is it possible for a collaborative robot to be rated as PLE? I have not seen a collaborative robot uh, rated as PLE in the, on the market. Most of them I see are PLD, and some of the collaborative robots, just like the ABB Yumi, are performance level B based off inherently safe design. Why not design the production line so humans and robots can't interact? Great idea. As a lot of people, a lot of lines are older, and they're trying to interject these collaborative robots into them. Um, just sometimes they're limited on space and the operation at hand. So each collaborative task is based off each individual application, or an individual risk assessment on each task is going to need to be done. Who is responsible for the risk assessment, the end user or the integrator? Well, here in the United States, um, OSHA dictates that the employer has to furnish the employer free from recognizable hazards to its employees. So in the United States, there is no standard or law that says a risk assessment shall be done. But based off the statement of the employer having of, uh, workplace free of recognizable hazards, risk assessment is a good way to document those hazards. Um, if you're over in Europe um, or like countries like Brazil, risk assessments are required by law. It has to be done out. You know, um, the CE marking process per the machinery director, thou shall do a risk assessment for the technical file or um, NR12 things for Brazil, you have to do a risk assessment, flat out law. But here in the States, you don't necessarily have to do one, but it's a best practice on how to document hazards and to track risk reductions within a manufacturing facility. Uh, okay, um, we have a couple more questions that just came in. Um, can you share a use case of collaborative robotics and share feedback of human working with robots? Um, I've, I've seen one application 
where the robot was driven by production numbers, and it had to have so many cycles per hour. Well, based off the cycle, um, they weren't within the allowable force regions. The operator had to go in there about every 10 minutes to reload a tray of parts the robot was picking up. So the parts were about the size of a coin, a large or a quarter, and there was 200 on the tray. Um, so what we ended up doing is put mechanical safeguarding on the back side of the robot, put a laser scanner on the front of the robot. Um, from there, um, as the operator approached the robot, the robot slowed down to the allowable forces, but didn't stop its motion. As the operator uh, replaced the tray, took the empty tray away from the robot, and as the operator went farther away from the robot, the robot sped back up to maintain speed, keep up with its production rates. Okay, um, final question. How often do you need to verify the system um, at the level of impacts than it was when it, it was new? Um, based off the initial impact, you know, as long as all your checksum number within the robot controller hasn't changed, um, a lot of people I've seen go through and do it annually just for annual verification and then like monthly to make sure the checksum hasn't changed. Or I've seen people that after the initial startup, they haven't reanalyzed. They haven't reanalyzed. Um, based off the um, standard after the initial impact, you know, as long as the system's not being modified, there's no verification required. Just to make sure, you know, on a regular basis. But I typically recommend yearly on anything. Okay, um, if we did not get to your question, we'll be sending everything to Dan. Um, I'm afraid that we've run out of time. I'd like to thank Dan and our sponsor, Pills. As a reminder, if you are registered as a group, please add the names and emails of all in attendance on the exit survey. On behalf of EHS today, have a productive remainder of the day.